Have you or someone you love recently been diagnosed with cancer? Are you wondering how to pray for yourself or a loved one battling cancer? Then stick around and consider sharing this episode with someone in the battle because today we're going to be talking about how to pray through the battle of cancer. My husband and I, as well as my guest today, have walked through this cancer journey. It's not one that anybody would invite into their lives. It's not one that anybody would wish on anyone else. But when you've been given a cancer diagnosis, you want hope to hold on to. And even if you haven't been given a cancer diagnosis, I guarantee you know several people who have. So this episode will encourage not only you, but them. Welcome back to another episode of your Hope-Filled Perspective, where it's always our goal to restore hope, renew minds, and empower listeners to live in their God-given identity. Today, we are going to be talking about finding hope and joy in the midst of cancer and learning how to pray, but pray honestly through it. My guest today is my friend, Nikki Hardy. You will remember her because she was on the program about a year ago, but I'm having her back because she's got a new book out, One Minute Prayers for Women with Cancer. Having walked this journey, I know what a valuable resource this is. So we're going to have an open and honest discussion today. Nikki is an author, a speaker, a podcast host, and a cancer thriver. As the author of Breathe Again, How to Live Well When Life Falls Apart, One Minute Prayers for Women with Cancer, and host of the Trusting God Through Cancer Summit. Her goal is to help you discover that life doesn't have to be pain-free to be full. So go live it. Welcome back to the program, Nikki. Oh, it's so good to be here. Thanks for having me back again. I feel like this is an area where we wouldn't necessarily have wanted to link arms but we were forced into it. And I'm so grateful to have had a friend like you who has gone through it. It's so true. No one um, asks us whether they, you know, whether we want to be put on the cancer train, but there we are, we wake up and we're on it and we didn't buy a ticket and we're off. Now I know your story, but for anyone who wasn't around for that first episode so long ago, will you share a little bit of your journey with our listeners today? Of course. So I actually lost my mum to cancer and then my sister to cancer six years after losing my mum. And then six weeks after losing my sister Jo, when she was just 43, I was diagnosed They both passed away from lung cancer. It was aggressive, small cell lung cancer. And um, unfortunately, they only survived about 14 months after their diagnosis. So you can imagine when I was diagnosed just six six weeks later, it felt like the heat seeking missile of death that came with our family had locked in on me. And specifically, Michelle, you know this, my cancer was rectal cancer. And so it felt like it had locked in on my rear end and... um, it just blew my whole world out of the water. I was fit, I was healthy as far as I was concerned. I'd just run a marathon. We had kids who are 14, 12 and nine. This was not on my radar. I almost felt immune. And you and I have talked about this before that I think one of the frustrating things about cancer is that so often it seems like, first of all, there is no rhyme or reason for who gets the diagnosis. You were the epitome of health. You took care of your body. And there also so often seems to be no rhyme or reason for who survives and who doesn't. And so all of a sudden we're thrust onto the cancer train, as you call it, with so many questions. What did I do wrong? What didn't I do? What should I do? What treatment is the right treatment? Why did I survive and they didn't survive? Did you go through any of that questioning? Oh, all of that and more. (laughs) You know, and not only questions about cancer and will I survive and what does this mean for our kids and how do you tell the kids? And we were leading a church. How much do we share with the church? But I mean, I had some serious questions for God as well. I was like, 
you're kidding me. I mean, you're kidding me, God. We have moved from England to North America to plant a church. We are doing your work, the work you called us to, and then this happens. Like, are you mad at me? Uh, did I do something? Are you punishing me? Um, it was just this whole kind of swirl. This, it, like a volcano erupted. And um, and I had a choice. We all have a choice as to what we do with those emotions, what we do with those questions. Are we going to take them to God or are we going to turn away from God at moments like that? And it's it's a it's a real choice, a choice I had to make daily, often minute by minute, because there are times when I just want to throw my arms up in the air and say, forget it, God, I I'm done. <laughs> That's so. what I love about you, Nikki, is that you're willing to admit those things that sometimes people don't even want to hear. The questioning yeah. God, it's real. But I also know it's real that God can handle our honest questions. And he would rather us ask him the questions and have an open dialogue than turn and run the other way. I exactly. remember where I was and what I was doing both when my husband told me he was diagnosed with cancer and when the doctor called and gave me the cancer diagnosis. So I'm curious, how did you respond when you got that call? Did you cry? Well, did you it, get angry? I mean, you mentioned some of the questions, but how about in that moment, that moment, in that moment to experience so in that moment, it was actually face to face. So I had had a colonoscopy and I was so unworried. We were so unworried by this colonoscopy. I mean, Michelle, I have had three wonderful, big bowling ball sized babies. And so, you know, we have issues down below us ladies after, you know, giving birth to big babies. And so I just thought, oh, it's that, you know, no, no need to worry. And so I actually went to my colonoscopy with a girlfriend. My husband had a church meeting and I didn't realize, given it was my first one and I was only 42, that after a colonoscopy, they normally give you an apple juice and a few crackers and say, everything's fine and send you on your way. I thought everyone got ushered into one of those small little soulless rooms with those fake leather, you know, fake leather <laughs> chairs that are semi-comfortable, but squeak when you get on them and they're ultimately wipeable. But, um, and the doctor came in and I think I was still a bit woozy from the, um, from the anesthesia. And he very kindly, I wanted to say, I could tell that he was um, very compassionate, but he said, I'm afraid we found a five centimeter tumor. And I mean, Five centimeters, I mean, that's metric, but it's kind of the size of a fun size Kit Kat. And he was saying, we found a tumor and it's either cancer or lymphoma. And my friend who was with me, she'd only just lost her sister to cancer too, a few years ago. And I had lost Joe, my sister, six weeks previously. And all I said, Michelle, was, oh, is there a third option? <laughs> and I think I was so stunned. I really don't think it registered. I mean, I'd like to say that I think it was the peace of the Lord descending from on high. <laughs> and but I think it was probably a bit of that, probably a bit of just no, 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 that doesn't happen to me because I'm invincible and partly anesthesia. And so when the doctor said, no, I'm afraid there isn't a third option, it's cancer or lymphoma you know, and my brain's going, aren't they the same thing? And, and he said, so we've taken a biopsy and your doctor will, you know, will give you a call. Now it was that call that I do remember what happened. I was in my car and I had just been for a run. I mean, at this point I'm still fit and healthy. I right. was been for a run. I've had the dog in the back of the car and he's panting and drooling and I'm hot and sweaty and very happy having been on a run and and I get the call and I see that it's my doctor's name flashing up on the caller ID and I pull off to the side of the road and I can tell you what I was looking at I was looking at the the trees 
um, and um, it was still winter. And I was in this kind of little um, car park, gravel car park where the uh, beside a church where the you know they have their their buses for the scouts and things. And and she told me that it was cancer and I was going to need chemo and radiation. I was going to need surgery. I'd probably have an ostomy bag. Then I'd need more surgery. Um, and she prayed for me. And it was at that moment, all my defenses came down. I had nothing left to give, nothing left to, no strength to hold on to. And um, that's when I cried. Yeah. And, you know, one of those those moments when it's ugly crying, there's not, there's yeah. mingled in with the sweat and the dog. And, and I was crying out to God then, and I was angry at God then, and I was both leaning into him and running away from him all at the same time, if that's possible. So yeah. that was the moment really when it sank in. When we hit rock bottom, what are some of the assumptions that we make about ourselves and God that make it so hard to connect with him during those times? Well, it's so interesting, Michelle, because there's a psychologist called Martin Seligman yeah. who has done an enormous amount of research. Yeah, you're, I'm sure you're familiar with him, but he has done a lot of work on um, resilience and he has shown that those people who come through traumatic events and things like this, um, but come through resilient they have dealt with the three lies that hold people back from learning resilience. Um, and those lies are permanence. It's always going to be like this. Yeah. Personalization. It's all my fault. And pervasiveness, pervasiveness, which is my whole life is ruined. And I really think those translate both into... Um, not just our emotional thoughts, but our spiritual thoughts. So yeah. it's always going to be like this with God. I'm always going to be battling something with God. Or now I can't trust him in any area of my life. Can I, is he safe um, in with my kids? Can I trust him with my future, with our finances, if this part of my life has fallen apart? And then we think, well, it must be my fault. He must be angry at me. He's punishing me. Or, um, you know, I'm, I'm just not spiritual enough. I, I, you know, shout at my kids on the way to church. I don't highlight my Bible and, you know, do watercolors in it. And I haven't had a quiet time in three weeks and, you know, those kind of things. So I think those three are the key things and um, lots of other things that we think that we think are unmentionable, but aren't. It's good to, to talk them out loud, um, kind of fall under those categories. Well, and it's helpful, I think, to talk them out loud, especially with others who have walked that path. I don't know if this was true for you, but, you know, we live in a day and age where what you did a nanosecond ago is on social media and everybody has an opinion, mm. but not everybody's opinion is helpful. Yes. So I think... God is the safest place that we can take those questions. But even recognizing that there's, there's strength that can be found by linking arms with others who have walked that journey before us, who have asked those questions, and sometimes who are still asking those questions. That's exactly. why I'm so thankful for you and your resources, your book, One Minute Prayers for Women with Cancer, the Trusting God Through Cancer Summit. Friends, I'm going to put all of Nikki's information in the show notes that you can find at drmichelleb.com. We're going to take a real quick break, but I want you to stick around with us because we're going to continue our discussion about finding hope and joy in the midst of cancer and learning how to pray honestly through it. We'll be right back. Welcome back to your hope-filled perspective. Today, my guest is my friend, Nikki Hardy. We have linked arms in collaborations several times before, so I know that you remember her from being on my podcast before. I've been on her summits. Unfortunately, it's cancer 
that brought us across each other's path, so to speak. But Nikki, it's because of that, that I have such a kindred spirit with you because you're willing to go to the places that a lot of people don't want to talk about. So I, I know that you talk about trusting God is something you can learn to do. Plan to trust and then trust the plan. Can you tell me more about how you came to that realization and then share the plan you created for yourself to help you trust God when you didn't really want to? Yes, of course. I mean, I got to that place because I realized that when my life was all happy and skippy and I was healthy, um, it's so easy to trust God and think we'll always trust God. I mean, my faith is so strong and, uh, you know, I'm never going to question God and uh, he's so good. And, you know, I see a rainbow at every turn and it's, you know, (laughs) and for once all the kids are happy and nothing's broken in my life. It's like, (laughs) and my faith is so strong. And then we get sucker punched and something sideswipes us and, oh, it's not that easy after all. Yeah. And so what I realized was that um, I needed to make a plan, a plan that would see me through when I didn't find it easy, that when I was struggling to trust God, when I really didn't want to trust God and wasn't even sure whether he was trustworthy or because it, he didn't feel trustworthy at that moment, I knew I needed a plan that I could follow that would lead me back to that place of trustworthy um, believing he was trustworthy, that I knew that I knew when life was good. Um, And, and so I developed this plan. It sounds really kind of formulaic, but it's really just a process to lead me through the steps of figuring out whether he is trustworthy and what happens when I do trust and how to trust in that process. So the first part of it is to check out God's credentials. And some people are horrified when I say this, you know, I'm like, but hold on a minute. If you get a new hairdresser, you're going to want to check out reviews. You probably only found them because your friend's hair looks fabulous. So you check out reviews, you ask around uh, and, or if it's a plumber, you know, are they going to show up when they say they're going to show up? Do they know how to do the work? And uh, is the work reliable? And so I thought, well, I can do this with God. I can check out whether he is who he says he is, whether he shows up and comes through on his promises and whether I am who he says I am and how he feels and treats his children. Yeah. And so I, you can, you can do that by reading stories in the Bible. You can do that by asking friends who seem to have rock solid faith and peace, no matter what throws at them by listening to podcasts like this and being encouraged by the stories of people who've been through things like you have and autobiographies, all sorts of places that it was just screaming at me that even though it didn't feel like it, evidence showed me that he was trustworthy. Even if it didn't look like I was hoping it was going to look like, or it wasn't going to happen. You know, my my idea of um, him coming through on his promises didn't happen in quite the same timeline, those kind of things. But I was checking out his credentials. And then I realized that I couldn't do it on my own. I needed to ask him for help. So following um, the example of the father who's son kept throwing himself into the fire um, and he says to Jesus I believe help my unbelief yes my mantra to God was I trust help my lack of trust you know I I do trust you God I've got this mustard seed of trust but it's really hard will you grow that will you strengthen it will you show up and show me how trustworthy you are I trust help my lack of trust and then we have to um, choose to hold on and let go. And they're kind of the third and fourth step almost rolled into one. What I realized was that I couldn't fully trust God if I was fully trusting myself or something else. And so I had to let go of the things that I was trusting over and above him. And I'm not saying don't trust your doctor or you know, don't trust family or friends, but, I, but it was 
for me, it was a case of turning to them instead of God, not finding the peace and the joy and the hope that he had for me because I wanted to stay in control. So I had to let go of that and an almost in one seamless <laughs> movement. So I didn't have nothing to hold on to, to hold on to him. And I had to choose to hold on to him because Michelle, you know this, many of us know this, that trusting God doesn't just happen the moment we meet Jesus. Mm. Like you say, it's a, it's a choice we have to make and we get to make because, you know, God gives us it free will. He's, you know, trust that isn't earned, isn't, you know, and given freely isn't true trust, just like his love. So I realized I had to let go and hold on all at the same time. And then finally, I wanted to create my own kind of bank of evidence to shore up those credentials. So writing in a journal, writing down how I see him um, come through, whether it's tiny things and often those are the most precious we want to say well in order to trust god he's got to heal me or this has to happen but actually those small frequent little gifts and and god shots and um little winks from him or whatever or the peace when i was lying in a um a scanner when really i was panicked but there was peace there. And I was like, well, this is odd. I'm feeling panic and peace at the same time. Um, and I was like, that's God. He's here. Um, and so keeping a record. And that was really helpful in building my trust in him, that whole process. So when I didn't feel like it, I was like, okay, what do his credentials say? Let's just I ask actually, him to help me. I like when you talk about creating that bank of evidence in breaking anxiety's grip, I give a trust acronym and the yes. last part for trust. The last T is turn to the testimony of prior experiences. And that is exactly what you're talking about. Looking back to see where did God show up? And you're right. It's not always in the big things like finding out you're healed. Yeah. Sometimes it's, you get a card in the mail with someone saying just what you needed to hear in that moment. Sometimes it's a nurse walking in saying, I thought you might like this. And it happens to be your favorite mm. flavor of pudding or whatever. <laughs> it's in those little things that only God could know that I think it really builds up that bank of evidence. But it really does. to your point, you have to be intentional about doing that. If we don't write it down, we have short memories as humans. We have a tendency to forget what God did. Mm. So true. So true. You know, on this podcast, we talk about finding a hope-filled perspective. But how can anyone battling through something hard like a cancer diagnosis hold on to hope and live with hope-tinted glasses when everything around you feels anything but hope-filled? finding hope when we are filled with fear and it feels like our hope is dwindling is is almost counterintuitive i think but then in the words of um oh i probably will butcher this quote but president snow from the hunger games he says when somebody is saying, you know, we, we've got to um, subdue the masses with fear. And he says there is only one thing stronger than fear, and that's hope. And it's so true. Finding this hope and, and in, even in the rings of power, this line I heard the other night was like, hope is never mere. Someone says we've only got mere hope, you know. And like, it's this tiny thing, but it's like hope is never mere. And when we, um, when we lean into it and we, we learn to trust God and we learn to look for the rubies in the rubble and we learn to, um, to laugh when all we want to do is cry, that is when this hope bubbles up. We I, I think we want to boil it up, that it's something we can create and we have to work hard at but I feel like it's something that bubbles up and, and stays within us and um, is something that we can hold on to. Um, and then 
I, you know me, Michelle, I'm all about laughing in the midst of things, especially when you've got rectal cancer. Oh my goodness, the most ridiculously funny things happen. And so you've got to start laughing and finding the joy in whatever shape and form joy takes for you. If that's art and music, put yourself in the way of it, you know, find art and music. If it's the outdoors, even if it's, they say that even just looking at a landscape picture or a picture of the ocean will conjure those same feelings of peace that um, the real thing will conjure. So sit in front of a landscape painting or a picture of the ocean, do what brings you joy, put yourself in the way of it. I like that. Put yourself in the way of joy because God sprinkles simple joys all around us. But sometimes I think we get so focused on the big things in life that we miss out on those simple things. Mm. I want you to talk for just a minute because I know at least in the cancer journey and most other hard things that we go through in life, if we're being honest, that tiredness can rob us of strength to trust God. And you talk about the tiredness trap and learning to live untired. I want you to unpack that. Talk about that a little bit, how you work to live that way, living the life that you have with the energy you long for. Because I know a lot of my listeners, some of them might not be going through a cancer journey, but they're caregiving to a loved one, or they have a prodigal child, or they're working three jobs, they're exhausted. How do we shore up that strength to trust God when we're so tired? It's such a great question. How do we get untired? And I came up with this this word, untired, when my husband asked how I was doing. And I said, I'm just, I'm just, and the word tired, didn't seem to sum it up. He's, you know, I said, I just want to feel, and it wasn't really alive. It wasn't like I wanted to feel like I had, you know, adrenaline running through my body and I could go on a 10 mile run. It was just that I w- felt trapped in this tiredness cycle. So I just said, I just want to feel untired. <laughs> and I was like, gosh, how many other people feel like that? How many people, especially after the last few years that we've had and for people who, like you say, are going through something or are caretaking for someone or praying for something and they're just tired of being tired. And I realized that I was caught in this trap where there's a cause and um, that has a consequence. And then we try and... um, kind of have a green smoothie, have a few nights um, extra of sleep or sleep in. And and so, but that doesn't really help because mm. the cause hasn't gone away. And, and so we just get caught in this trap. And I'm not saying all our causes of tiredness can be dealt with. You know, if, if you're caretaking for someone, you can't necess- you can't just stop. Um, or if you've got cancer, you'll say, oh, cancer's making me tired. I won't have cancer anymore because it's making me tired. You know, you can't do that. But we can look at the other things around us and within that um, kind of tangle of things that are going on in our lives and things. Well, what is it that is is keeping us this way that we do have some control over, that we can um work to fight against is it an emotional thing is it a practical thing is it that we need to ask for help what is it but it's not until we really look at what's keeping us tired um, and stop treating just the symptoms that that we can get untired yeah friends we're going to take a real quick commercial break but stick with us because i want nikki to share with you her hope-filled perspective. We'll be right back. Welcome back to your hope-filled perspective, where today we've been talking about finding hope and joy in the midst of cancer and praying through it. 
Nikki, in 2019, my husband and I lost more than 19 friends and family to this horrible disease. But we also had the opportunity and the honor to walk alongside them through it. And I'm wondering if you would share from your perspective what we can do to support our friends who are on this cancer journey. It is such an important question. How can we love people going through cancer and really going through any devastatingly hard circumstance? Um, And we do get terribly tongue-tied. We get up in our own head about, well, oh, I don't want to impinge or impose. And, um, you know, will I get in the way? And what do I actually say? And um, there is a huge huge benefit in a as you say walking with someone and the ministry of presence as it's called and I think we can stop ourselves doing that because we think we don't know how to do it and I'm a firm believer in saying I don't know how to do this you've never had cancer before I've never walked through cancer with someone before I don't know what I'm doing but I do know that what I'm trying to do is love you and support you and be with you and I'm going to get it wrong and I'm giving you the freedom to tell me but I just want to be here for you and pray for you and I think that's freeing for both the person going through the situation it's it's empowering and freeing for you Um, so just admitting that you want to be there and you'll probably mess up is a great way to start another way when somebody tells you that they've been diagnosed I hate to say it, please don't share the story of the, you know, your elderly aunt's next door neighbor's friend who died of that within three months. You know, I had somebody say that to me. They just said, oh, well, Doc did that last year. And I was like, oh, thank you so much for telling me. That's encouraging, not. (laughs) So one of the most wonderful things that anyone said to me when I told them I was diagnosed was my good friend who just said, well, that sucks. And it was so raw and so honest. And what she was saying is, I hate that for you. Yeah. And that was wonderful. Just say, oh, I'm so sorry. That must be really hard. Yeah. And that that's okay. That's okay. And we can ask how we can be praying for people. Is there anything specific we can be praying for? Um, Another good thing is, you know, shooting texts with encouraging scriptures or just saying no need to reply, but I'm praying this for you. The no need to reply is just such a gift. Um, Or I'm heading out to um, to the chemist. I'm picking up prescriptions for myself. Do you need me to pick any up for you? I'm running by the grocery store. Can I pick, you know, do you need a pint of milk? things like that, or um, my kids, you know, need to get out of the house. Can they walk without your dog for them, for you? Or can I pick up your kids and carpool them to soccer? Things like that are really helpful as well. When we say, and I've been guilty of this so much, let me know how I can help. Yeah. It's, I'm, I've been guilty of it so many times, but it, it puts the, the burden back on the person who's going through they have to come up with some jobs they might not want someone you know putting their dirty undies in the laundry for them but if you can come deliver something and just say look can I would you like me to quickly clean your kitchen or get that stuff out of the tumble dryer for you depending on how close you are Um, and that's another thing that I learned um, was about kind of thinking about how well connected you are to the person. Because I had people who were very close to me who were showing up and um, doing things like that, you know, taking my kids to um, activities and um, cleaning the kitchen, that kind of thing. Then there were people who were making meals and they didn't come in, they delivered them to the doorstep, whatever. But then I knew there was a whole army of people supporting the supporters. And this is something that I've learned that I can do when I hear about somebody who's 
who's been diagnosed or is going through a really hard time, but I don't really know them well enough. I'm just connected through this one friend, but they are really involved in helping. I try and support the supporters and Mm -hmm. take their kids to soccer and make them a meal because I know that they have been over at their friend's house all day. So those are some of the kind of things that we can be doing. Um, Yeah. I like those. Those are very practical. And I especially like the idea to support the supporters because as we support them, they can do more to support the ones that they love. But I also really love your first point. And that is just to say, look, I've never been through cancer. You've never been through it before. I'm going to mess up, but just know that my heart is to love you and support you through it. It's almost like when my children were young, I tried to instill in them just to apologize first. And it takes the anger and the ire out of the person that you did something to. It diffuses it. And kind of that's what you're saying. I'm just going to apologize now. I might say something wrong. I might not do something you need me to do or, or be perceptive, but know that my heart is in the right place. And that means so much when you're going through a hard time. Nikki, for the listener who's been listening in on this conversation and they're resonating with it today, either they've received a difficult diagnosis or they know someone who has, or they're going through some other hard cancerous time in their life, what hope-filled perspective would you want to leave them with today? Really, I think you mentioned it at the beginning, this phrase that um, has become my mantra, if you like, that life doesn't have to be pain-free to be full. So let's go and live it. This came, Michelle, from um, when I was diagnosed and and I said to God, I I thought you came to give me an abundant life. Uh, where's the full life that you you said you can you said I have come that you might have life and life to the full and this feels empty and hard right now and I know you said there'd be storms so it got me thinking well maybe I'm just in a storm right now maybe the troubles that he said I would have are here and the abundant life is waiting off in the future somewhere when life gets better and then I was thinking well what if I don't get better does that mean I don't get to participate in that full abundant life and then I realized maybe he didn't mean those two things to be separated in time and space Mm. maybe they could happen at the same time I could experience troubles and a full abundant life at the same moment and also maybe I've been guilty of equating a full abundant life with Facebook fabulous and everything being wonderful Maybe it wasn't that. Maybe it was a deeper, richer abundance and fullness of connection and intimacy and laughter and joy and hope and peace with him and with others. And so that's really what my first book, Breathe Again, How to Live Well When Life Falls Apart, is about. about. It's about how to find that full abundant life, that hopeful perspective right in the midst of our hardest times, not waiting for life to get better. That's so good. That's so good. Living it in the midst of the hard. Nikki, as we wrap up this episode, I just love your book, One Minute Prayers for Women with Cancer. Would you be willing to close out this episode with an entry from this book to pray over our audience? I would absolutely love to, Michelle. And um, it's split up into various sections And um, one of the sections is called um, when you're wrestling with faith for when you're wrestling with faith. And there are a number of different devotions under that. But um, one of them is, but you still want to praise God. And this one is called bubbling within you. And it's the scripture is from Psalm 40, one to three, or it's a praise version of it. I waited patiently for the Lord. He set my feet on a rock. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Hurry up and wait. It's the familiar refrain to our cancer melody. We're rushed into testing or surgery, and then we wait endlessly for results or for our bodies to heal. It's one of the worst things about having cancer. Worrying and waiting are torturous. Yet when we wait for God to see us, show up or hear our cries, which he always does, 
He plants our feet on solid ground and shows us more of who he is. From here comes a new song of praise. What's the new song he's caused to bubble up within you today? And here's the prayer. Why don't we pray? Lord, I've waited for you through endless nights and tear-filled days, and you saw me and you heard me. I'm no longer being tossed around by my cancer, but I'm on solid ground where I won't lose my footing. So I give you glory. Even though I can't hold a tune, I sing praises to your name. In the weeks and months ahead, help me remember this truth and teach me to always hurry up and wait for you. Amen. Amen. Nikki, thank you for sharing out of your pain, out of your heartache, out of your experience and your wisdom. Friends, I'm going to put all of Nikki's information about her books, her summits, all the stuff in the show notes that you can find at drmichellebee.com. Friends, And I should say, Michelle, just, just as we're closing, we were talking about um, feeling untired and trusting yeah. God. And I know you said you'd share... I've got a few um, free eBooks that people can grab if they speak to, to them. But one is how to trust God when you can't stop worrying. And the other is um, waking up happy when you're tired of being tired. So if those resonate with people, they can grab those as well. Excellent. And we will put those in the show notes. So go find the show notes at drmichelleb.com. And friends, cancer is so prevalent that even if you've not been diagnosed, I guarantee you have a friend who has. So would you consider sharing this episode with them to give them a hope-filled perspective for their cancer journey? This has been Dr. Michelle Bankston with your hope-filled perspective. Friends, it's my prayer for you that until we meet again next week, may you have a hope-filled week.